In February 1945, as the Second World War was drawing to a close, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt met King Abdulaziz ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. Naturally, Palestine came up. Roosevelt tried to persuade Ibn Saud to support massive immigration of Jewish World War II refugees and Holocaust survivors to Palestine. King Ibn Saud gave an interesting reply. Give the Jews and their descendants the choicest lands and homes of the Germans who have oppressed them. The president retorted by saying that the Jews preferred Palestine. The king replied, the criminal should make amends, not the innocent bystander. Ibn Saud's suggestion of settling the Jews in the lands of their German oppressors' lands not only made sense as a manifestation of justice, but it was also practical. The number of Jews in Europe was much larger than in Palestine, and unlike Palestine, where nearly all of the Jews were first or second generation immigrants, the European Jews had been living in Europe for centuries. After the Second World War, Germany lost about 25% of its territory. East Prussia, West Prussia, Silesia and Pomerania were detached and became parts of Poland and the Soviet Union. Assas and Lorraine were reclaimed by France. Germans were forcibly removed from all these regions. Another 27,000 square kilometers could easily have been de-Germanized and Jews could have been settled there. An independent Jewish state between Poland and Germany on the Baltic Sea could have been created. The Germans had viciously murdered millions of Soviet citizens, Poles and Jews. The latter deserved a right to the lands of the Germans just like the former two victims of German savagery. But a Jewish state on the Baltic wasn't what the Zionists wanted. They wanted Palestine at all costs. And that is why they sabotaged efforts to repatriate Jewish refugees to places other than Palestine during the World War. This caused many Jews who could have been saved to fall under the Nazi butcher's knife. To many, this was sheer callousness. But to Zionists, this was strategy. As C.S. Lewis pertinently noted, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. I am Dr. Hassan Bukhari, and this is the seventh episode of our series, Palestine versus Israel. The Second World War brought the issue of anti-Semitism to the fore again. German dictator Adolf Hitler declared in January 1939, If international finance jury inside and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thereby the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. Hitler was as good as his word, and after the outbreak of the World War later that year, he devoted considerable resources to crush European Jewry. German anti-Semitism gave birth to the Holocaust that left millions of Jews exterminated. The ordeal of European Jews gave rise to the Jewish refugee problem. Millions wanted to leave German-occupied Europe, but the guardians of human rights and democracy, that is the USA and Britain, weren't willing to take them in. The chief global champions of Jewish rights, the Zionists, only wanted the Jewish refugees rescued if they be allowed to come and settle in Palestine as part of their settler colonial project. But Britain didn't want to alienate the Arabs further by violating the immigration quotas set in the 1939 White Paper. This led to a complex situation. On one hand, the Zionists wanted to fight alongside the British against Germany to save themselves from Hitler. On the other hand, they wanted to defy the British 
and bring as many Jews as possible in Palestine to change the demography of that country to their advantage. In a very impressive manner, and thanks to their superbly organized political structures, the Zionists were able to tread both paths simultaneously. During the World War, the Haganah took the responsibility of conducting illegal Jewish immigration to Palestine in defiance of the White Paper. It even smuggled a few thousand Middle Eastern Jews into Palestine, despite the fact that unlike European Jews, they faced no threat of annihilation or persecution. Due to the tussle between the British and the Zionists, tragedies took place. In November 1914, SS Patria, a ship full of Jewish refugees bound for Mauritius and anchored in the port of Haifa, sunk when Haganah operatives placed a bomb inside it. The bomb was intended to disable the ship and force the British authorities to admit the 1900 refugees on board to enter Palestine. But the ship sank after the explosion. 200 Jewish refugees and 12 British policemen were killed. The Zionist propaganda blamed the British for the tragedy, who agreed to let the remaining refugees stay in Palestine. The Patria episode produced another interesting result. An important concession made to the Arabs in the White Paper of 1939 was that a number of mandatory government heads of departments were to be appointed from amongst the Arabs. British and Zionists had served in these positions, but the Arabs never had. The plan for Arab appointments, however, was shelved after the Patria incident to placate the Zionists that the British government was cowed by Zionist propaganda globally especially in the USA. This was the first of many such episodes in which German crimes, British callousness towards Jews and Zionist propaganda muscle converged to hit the hapless Arabs of Palestine. From day one, the World War II Jewish tragedy became impregnated with an Arab tragedy spawned by the Germans, British and the Zionists. In his book, The Politics of Rescue, Henry Feingold raised the suspicion that the Zionists were only secondarily interested in rescuing the Jewish victims of Hitler. For them, the greater good of the Jews demanded that the political and propaganda value of the Jewish refugee problem be exploited to the full. They were adamant that the Jewish refugees be only taken to Palestine and then admitted as permanent residents there. The Zionists were perfectly happy to reject any rescue proposal for Jewish refugees that didn't incorporate these two demands. They simply blamed the resultant plight of the refugees on the Germans and the British and launched a propaganda offensive designed to imprint the image of the Jewish victim on the psyche of the British and American public and guilt them into pressurizing their governments to cave in to Zionist demands. For example, when some American Jews touted the idea of free ports in Palestine where Jewish refugees could remain during the war, it was shot down by Zionists. The reason was that the proposal didn't include the demand to make these temporary refugees permanent residents of Palestine. Zionist resistance to the British in Palestine wasn't confined to backing illegal immigration. After a brief lull in which the Germans were at the gates of Palestine, Zionist terrorism against the British resumed as well. Vladimir Jabotinsky, the revisionist Zionist leader, died in 1940. For about two years, the Rivianists were without a strong leader. This changed in April 1942 with the arrival of Menachem Begin in Palestine. Begin was a former Betar operative and soon after his arrival, the German threat to Palestine vanished with Rommel's defeat at Al Alamein. In 1943, Begin, a future Prime Minister of Israel, allied with the Lehi or the Stern Gang among whose leaders was now one Yitzhak Shamir, another future Prime Minister of Israel. The purpose of the alliance between the Rivianist Ergun and the Stern Gang was to reignite terrorist activities to force the British to leave Palestine. 
The most famous Zionist act of anti-British terrorism during World War II came in November 1944 when members of the Stern gang murdered Lord Moin, Deputy Minister of State for Middle East Affairs in Cairo and a close friend of Churchill. Churchill was livid. He declared to the House of Commons, If our dreams for Zionism are to end in the smoke of assassins' pistols, and all labors for its future to produce only a new set of gangsters worthy of Nazi Germany, many like myself will have to reconsider the position we have maintained so consistently in the past. Lord Moim's assassination could have been disastrous for the Zionists, who didn't want the full might of the British Empire thrashing them in the same way as the Arabs during the Arab revolt a few years ago. In order to control the damage, David Van Gorian vehemently denounced the assassins and the Haganah joined the British in a full-scale offensive against both the Ergun and the Stern gang. Interestingly, Lord Moin's assassination was solely the work of the Stern gang, but Haganah focused much more on striking the Ergun because the Labour Zionists led by Ben Gurion were wary of its growing popularity. But here, Begin showed great loyalty to the Zionist cause and flatly refused to retaliate against the Haganah. This action of Begin ensured the unity of Zionists as they pursued the goal of a Zionist state in Palestine. Now, I will briefly discuss the Zionist collaboration with the British during the Second World War. The Jews of Palestine exhibited much enthusiasm in joining the British war effort in sharp contrast to the Arabs. The British themselves wanted to maintain parity in recruitment from Palestine between Arabs and Jews, but this proved impossible due to Arab apathy and Zionist zeal. The Zionists were aiming to kill two birds with one stone. They wanted to fight and repel the Germans, and they wanted to gain practical military experience as they had one eye on the post-war situation. They knew that in the end the issue might come down to an armed struggle with the Arabs after the British departure and they wanted to be ready. In the first month of the war, the main national executive organ of the Jews in mandatory Palestine, the Vaad Lumi, called for volunteers for national service. More than 100,000 volunteered in five days. The British encouraged Zionist collaboration and helped the Haganah to establish a Zionist commando force called the Palmach in May 1941. Led by Yitzhak Sadeh, Palmach operatives participated in the British campaign against Vichy Syria. By 1942, thousands of Palestinian Jews were serving with British forces in the Middle East. In August 1942, Jewish battalions were raised by the British, which incorporated 18,000 Palestinian Jewish soldiers. The Zionists also demanded that a separate Jewish division be created. This demand was partially fulfilled in October 1944, when a Jewish brigade was established under the command of Brigadier Ernest Benjamin. The brigade had its own Zionist banner, and it saw combat in Italy as part of the British 8th Army. The experience of service in the Jewish Brigade proved invaluable for Zionists as it served as a training facility of modern war for them. The Zionists were now able to fight a conventional war ably under the guidance of the veterans of the Jewish Brigade. The Haganah also continued to flourish during the World War and maintain its separate identity and structure. By the end of the war, its numbers had reached 21,000. In short, more than 40,000 well-trained and armed Jews were at the beck and call of the Zionist leaders after the Second World War. In addition to the effective militarization of Zionists, the Second World War also brought an economic boom. Before the war, 2,000 Jewish factories were active in Palestine. By 1945, this number had surpassed 7,000. The Jewish population also experienced significant growth due to both legal and illegal immigration. From 85,000 in 1918, a mere 10% of the total population of Palestine, 
the Jewish population had risen to 560,000 or 32 percent of the total in 1946. By the end of the Second World War, the Zionist settler colonial project had also found a new superpower sponsor after the Zionist relations soared with the British following the 1939 White Paper. This was the United States of America, a superpower with a very wealthy, educated and influential Jewish community, the USA was much suited as the new chief benefactor of Zionism. A pivotal Zionist conference held during the Second World War at New York's Biltmore Hotel in May 1942 signaled the shift of Zionist overseas activities from Britain to the USA. The Biltmore Resolution demanded the establishment of an independent Jewish Commonwealth in all of Palestine. Weizmann was decisively upstaged by Ben-Gurion at the Biltmore Conference and was eased out of effective leadership. Ben-Gurion emerged as the chief Zionist leader and in contrast to Weizmann advocated that all means necessary including violence be used to achieve the Jewish state. In a memorandum to the Jewish agency, just after the Biltmore Conference, he declared that the Zionists must be ready for an armed struggle. After the Biltmore Conference, the Zionists established two Christian organizations to rally the comparatively more religious American public behind the Zionist cause. These were the American Palestine Committee and the Christian Council on Palestine. According to Professor Charles Smith, both of these organizations received Zionist subsidies and proved to be extremely effective in mobilizing support that including demanding that the United States oppose the 1939 White Paper. As a result of these efforts, both the Republican and Democratic platforms of 1944 endorsed the creation of a Jewish Commonwealth as designated in the Biltmore Resolutions. The Second World War brought a great tragedy for European Jews in the Holocaust. But it also created conditions that imparted great strength to the Zionists in Palestine. The Zionists now had a trained military supported by a robust economy. They also had complete US support which more than offset the damage caused by British ambivalence. The Arabs were disunited as always and had failed to benefit from the opportunity of gaining military experience through service in the British military. With the end of the Second World War, the Zionists ramped up terrorism against the war-weary British. Firmly backed by the USA, the Zionists knew that the British wouldn't be able to mete out to them the treatment received by the Arabs during the 1936 revolt. They also augmented their diplomatic efforts to isolate the British and forced them to vacate Palestine. They knew that they could easily deal with the weak Arabs after the British departure. In the next episode of Palestine vs Israel, I will discuss the post Second World War developments in Palestine which led to a sudden British withdrawal from Palestine and the outbreak of the first Arab-Israel war. Stay tuned, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.